folks. Welcome back to Dom Africa. This is Chris once again. Hello, folks. Welcome back to Chris White Africa here on the Daba Broadcasting Network. Today, the 8th of May, 2021. Let's get right to today's headlines from around Africa and around the world. Transport Minister Fikile Maulula uh, has uh, reported that uh, parastatals under his ministry's control are failing on his watch. The Daily Maverick issues an op-ed saying that ANC theft has become a way of life in South Africa. Changes are coming to South Africa's schools for specific changes in this coming year. And what happened to South African Airways 28747s when it was once a prestigious airline? Where did they go? Simple Flying asked that story and tells us the answers. Good news for WhatsApp users in South Africa. Facebook will not suspend WhatsApp users in South Africa if they fail to accept the new terms and conditions by the 15th of May. They have not stated when they will change that. But for the meantime, if you're a WhatsApp user in South Africa, you will not have your account suspended by the 15th of May if you fail to accept the new terms and conditions. Malawi orders 2,000 refugees to return to camps and no longer be integrated into Malawian society. That's a couple of days ago. And then yesterday, President Chakwera, Lazarus Chakwera, stands firm by that decision and will not budge on the requirement to return refugees to camps. Apparently nobody is safe in Nigeria. Lots of uproar, lots of challenges to President Buhari's governance over the increasing number of violent crimes, kidnappings, terrorist activity taking place across Nigeria. And the Basketball Africa League, an offshoot of the United States' National Basketball Association, the NBA, will launch its new league and its first game on the 16th of May in Kigali, Rwanda. Italy grown Coco, apparently accounts for 15% of Cote d'Ivoire's cocoa crop, putting them in jeopardy of running afoul of European Union regulations on conservation. Mauritanian members of parliament have filed a complaint against former President Aziz, who is under criminal charges for corruption, after he laid a claim against members of parliament accusing them of accepting bribes while he was president. Namibia's poultry sector is ripe for expansion, and Speaker of the House... Nancy Pelosi confuses Willies. She confuses the since past Willie McCovey, who died in 2018, with Willie Mays. Say hey, Willie Mays, who turned 90 in a famous uh, snafu. She blames it on a staffer who put the wrong photograph up of the deceased Willie McCovey when she meant to honor the still living nontogenarian Willie Mays. Say hey, Willie Mays, one of the greatest players in Major League Baseball history. But once again, virtue signaling fails for people who are not genuine. They're just drive-by carers. And finally, U.S. farmers are suing the racist Biden administration for its laws that failed to uphold the Constitution, violating specifically the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause in denying relief to people based on their skin pigmentation. In a case that's certain to cause shockwaves, the racist regime of Biden, you know, the one that banned 1.6 billion people of color from India from traveling to the United States? That's right. That same regime, the same racist regime that imposed travel restrictions banning South Africans, a country majority people of color, from coming to the United States. And they've also made a pandemic relief program that only benefits people based on their skin color who are in farming. A disabled American farmer has filed a lawsuit, and others have joined this lawsuit. And those are the headlines, folks. Let's get into analysis of what's been happening around Africa and around the world on this Saturday, the 8th of May, 2021. Trying something new here. I switched over to Brave because Firefox has been acting up. So let's see how it goes. Well, there we go. Fikile Mbalula on Thursday painted a bleak picture about state-owned entities falling under his department, saying some have racked up losses amounting to billions during the lockdown. Well, here's a little newsflash for Fikile. Uh, these ministries, these parastatals have racked up billions of losses before the pandemic. Don't blame the pandemic for the failures. Blame your government and your National Coronavirus Command Council for its idiotic regulations and rules, criminalizing normal conduct by South Africans, let, letting people walk on beaches, not letting people go to stores to buy food, not letting people do anything, closing down e-commerce, banning the sale of open-toed shoes, banning cooked chicken. What was wrong with these morons? Talk about Moody and witch doctors. It's definitely firmly in the camp of the African National Congress who wouldn't know science if it bit him in the face. Remember, its supporters are people who ran around campuses saying science must fall and math is racist. 
Yeah, okay. How's that working for you, idiots? So these ministries, these parastatals have been failing this ministry long before the pandemic. This is a disaster, been bilking. Those who actually pay taxes, a small number of South Africans been getting bilked for years. Situation was so dire that some of the distressed entities faced shortfalls in operational expenditure and will record low revenue in the coming years. Fikile revealed this when he briefed the National Council of Provinces on mitigating the impact of the pandemic in the transport industry. He said the loss of revenue during lockdown for various transport subsectors presented a challenge as transport operators experienced unexpected shortfalls in the revenue. <laughs> Operations in aviation came to a complete halt as we closed the airspace to both domestic and international travel, foolish move, except for repatriation and medical evacuations. This led to airline operators that were already under financial distress, such as the South African Airways and Comair, to go into business rescue. It did. So there you have the admission from a minister in the ANC's government admitting that they destroyed the economy. Put that in English for you. They admit they destroyed the economy. There'll be no consequences, though, for the millions of lost jobs, the destroyed lives, those who committed suicide out of desperation, those who needlessly became infected. There'll be no consequences for the ANC. You have an opportunity, South Africa, to make the ANC pay. On the 27th of October, 2021, let's see if we can't get a record number of people to turn out to vote against the ANC and vote for another political party. Give a single political party the majority in every major metro and then people have an opportunity to see honest, legitimate parties govern until 2024 when the next national elections take place. This is the critical moment for South Africa's future. Will you vote or will you moan and complain about the Democratic Alliance or about parties being too small or about your vote not mattering? Well, that's on you, the 17 million South Africans who failed to vote in the last national election. And there'll be even more. Municipal elections typically get just 30 to 38% of the electorate to turn out. So will you be in the 38% or will you be part of the 62% that does nothing to fix South Africa? It's not like anyone's asking you to march in a parade or to give money to a cause or to donate your time or to fight a liberation struggle. People are simply asking you to go out and vote. It's not complicated. It doesn't take a lot of your time. It is your civic duty. Do it and stop bitching about it. Fix the country, South Africa. Four changes coming to schools in South Africa, and these are reported by the Ministry of Education. So, the basic education. In its annual performance plan, the department said this will include an investigation to the use of bilingual questions. So now we're going to put two languages on every exam. Yeah, that's going to be real helpful. Item banking, really no idea what this is supposed to mean. They said the process developing an advanced system of generating question papers called item banking. It will generate questions and papers, marking guidelines for all public examinations. This significant intervention will be phased in over the next few years for general education certificate grade nine and national senior certificate. The question papers and marking guidelines will be generated from pool of items that are coded by subject area, question type, level of complexity, and other. Aha, it sounds to me like yet another way to dumb down the education system. Seems very unclear. Item banking, this is an odd Orwellian state term attached there. Electronic marking, they're going to take grading out of the hands of learner or of teachers and put it in the hands of computers, computers that can be manipulated. Well, we'll see what happens there. And online applications, that's probably a helpful thing, having online applications for education. Those are the four changes coming this year to South Africa. Of course, you know, there are no other priorities. There's no collapsed, you know, economy to deal with. There's there's no issue of 5 million illegal aliens in the country. There's no issue of the pandemic to deal with. No, it's more important. Or, 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 what about corruption? Violence? No, no, we have to fix the education system. To be fair, the Department of Basic Education does have responsibility to fix education, but they're busy designing two new universities when they can't even educate the population as it exists. So South African Airways once had close to 50 aircraft and they flew 28 Boeing 747s quite an iconic fleet. Whatever happened to those 747s? Simple flying asked that question. South African Airways has frequently been the news in recent years owing to its ongoing financial difficulties. It's seen its fleet shrink to just 12 aircraft, all of which are Airbus. However, in years gone by, SAA also operated Boeing 28 examples of the iconic 747. But what happened to those? And of course, you look at that livery, that's the old SAA before the uh, 1994 elections right there. That's from March 1968. That was the first of five 747s that they ordered back in 1968. The 1994-98 heralded the arrival of a pair of secondhand cargo 747s. Eight 747s is the most 
numerous joint jumbo variant operated eight examples was the case of the 200 series. These aircraft lasted for SAA between 10 and 15 years. And SAA was one of the few that operated the 747SP. There you go, very unusual variant of the 747. But they're all gone now. They're all gone. This one's been preserved at South African Airways Museum Society in Johannesburg since September 2006. The remaining four examples were broken apart between 1999 and 2008. What an unceremonious end to an iconic aircraft and an iconic airline, South African Airways. So South Africa, WhatsApp users, relax, take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. Facebook will not be deleting your account on the 15th of May, at least according to a press release from Facebook. WhatsApp has released a statement on its website informing users that they will not immediately lose functionality if they fail to accept the company's new terms of service and privacy policy by May 15th. It's a softening of Facebook's uh, mobile instant messaging original stance on the deadline. It had previously warned users they would lose some functionality if they don't accept the new terms. If you haven't accepted them by May 15th, they will not delete your account. However, you won't have full functionality of WhatsApp until you accept. For a short time, you'll be able to receive calls and notifications, but won't be able to read or send messages from the app. Well, so what really has changed here? They're still trying to coerce you into accepting their overly intrusive uh, you know, terms and conditions. But that's your choice, folks. The good news is all your data is encrypted from end to end, so Facebook can't read the data. And so there you have it. No one else can intercept it. But Malawi has ordered 2,000 refugees to return to camps. These are long-standing refugees who've been in the country for many, many years. And this is raising a few hackles internationally. Al Jazeera reports on this from a couple of days ago. Despite years of integration, the government claims refugees could pose a threat to national security by living amongst locals. <laughs> the Malawi government has ordered thousands of long-integrated refugees to return to its sole but badly overcrowded refugee camp in a controversial move that may have many have vowed to resist. The United Nations estimates about 2,000 refugees residing in the camp at Zaleka, about 40 kilometers north of Lilongwe. Many have lived there for years, setting up businesses in the town or marrying Malawians and having children with them. But the government argues they pose a danger to national security by living among locals. If they're married, they must apply for permanent residence instead of just spreading themselves around the country. Ooh, sounds to me like a little bit of xenophobia going on there, don't you? With an initial capacity between 10 and 14,000 refugees around 1994, the camp now houses 49,386 people and several hundred continue to arrive each month. The deadline for refugees to return to the camp was April 28th, but a last-minute court injunction gave them brief respite. Speaking one of Malawi's main language, Chichewa, he told the Agence France Presse, he sought asylum in the Southern African country 13 years ago, eventually setting up a small retail business from Burundi. Kanamula John, who represents Rwandan refugees in the camp, is also concerned about congestion in the facility. Well, this is getting a lot of attention. For his part, Malawian President Lazarus Chikerwa is not budging. He stands firm on the relocation of refugees just a day after that story appeared in Al Jazeera. Refugees and their advocates in Malawi have expressed alarm at President Lazarus Chikerwa's defense of a plan to force 2,000 people back into a refugee camp. A court injunction has prevented their immediate relocation, but authorities have appealed the order. Speaking with CNN on Thursday, Chikerwa said the government was enforcing the law by moving to relocate refugees staying outside their designated camp. Well, this is not going well for anyone, folks. Not going well for anyone. Meanwhile, Kenya is doing its first ever national census of wildlife. Kenya starts a national census to help with conservation. Began its first national wildlife census on Friday, aiming to, const aiming to aid conservation and identify threats to the vast but threatened wildlife populations. The census will run through July with rangers, research community members, counting animals on land and from helicopters. And according to the Guardian's report from Emmanuel Ekinwotu, nobody is safe. Nigeria reels from nationwide wave of deadly violence. President Muhammadu Buhari faces criticism from allies and opposition as security crises leave hundreds dead. Buhari has come under mounting pressure from critics and allies in recent weeks. An alarming wave of violence has left millions in Africa's most populous country in uproar at the collapse of security. Attacks by jihadist groups in the Northeast have been compounded by a sharp rise in abductions targeting civilians in schools and at interstate links across Nigeria. Mass killings by bandit groups in rural towns, a reported rise in armed robberies in urban areas, and increasingly daring attacks on security forces by pro Biafran militants in the Southeast have also risen. In April alone, almost 600 civilians were killed across the country and at least 406 abducted by armed groups, according to analysis by the Council on Foreign Relations. The violence has left much of the, much of the country on the edge, and Buhari facing the fiercest criticism since he took office. Well, the violence is absolutely appalling and shocking, and with 600 people killed in a month, they're challenging South Africa to be Africa's murder capital. That's crazy. When I read this, nobody's safe. I thought the article was about South Africa, but no, it's about Nigeria. 
things have deteriorated rapidly in Nigeria over the past 12 months during the pandemic and the lockdown. Things have only gotten worse with all these different sources of chaos and the police and security services seeming inability to deal with these issues. This puts a lot of pressure on President Buhari, a graduate of the U.S. Army War College back in 1980, who recently suggested, not suggested, but called for the moving of the U.S. Africa Command from Stuttgart, Germany, to somewhere on the cut on the continent to help Africans deal with crises, security crisis. This is a 180 degree turnabout from where Nigeria stood back in 2007 when it was a vocal opponent of the creation of US Africa Command, let alone its basing in Africa. Quite a turnaround. Of course, Buhari would be one of the few heads of state around the world who's particularly well informed about US military and national security policy, having been a graduate of US Army War College. But nobody's safe in Nigeria, apparently. That's pretty frightening stuff. Meanwhile, the National Basketball Association's new Africa-based league finally gets underway on May 16th in Kigali. The National the Basketball Africa League's opening game will see Nigeria's River Hoopers take on the home side, the Patriots, as a long-awaited NBA-affiliated tournament tips off in Kigali on the 16th of May. The BAL, which will be broadcast on its entirety on ESPN in Africa, will see 12 teams compete in three groups of four, then the three-round knockout phase culminating in the finals on May 30th. So it's a tournament, not a season. That is interesting. Champions from the National Leagues of Angola, Egypt, Morocco, Nigeria, Senegal, and Tunisia earned their participation in the inaugural season. There are many six teams which come from Algeria, Cameroon, Madagascar, Mali, Mozambique, and Rwanda secure their participation through BAL qualifying tournaments conducted by the FIBA Regional Office Africa across the continent in late 2019. First week of the tournament, we'll see three games played per day starting at 2 p.m. local time, 8 a.m. Eastern, with teams like uh, Zamalek, Egypt, AS Duanas, Senegal, and U.S. Uh, Monastir, Tunisia, set to be sides to watch in the group stage. And this is where it'll be played, the Kigali Arena. The Hoopers, whose coach told ESPN the coronavirus-induced delay over a year was a blessing in disguise, having have one of the more high-profile rosters in the tournament, featuring the likes of former NBA guard Ben Uzo and G League veteran Taryn Sullivan. There you go, folks. There you have it. The National Basketball Association expands to Africa. A study has found that 15% of the cocoa grown in Ivory Coast is grown in what is supposed to be protected forest. This puts Ivory Coast in a very difficult position with the European Union and may put them in jeopardy. Around 15% of the cocoa farms in the world's largest grower, Ivory Coast, are protected forest areas, potentially breaching standards expected in upcoming European Union law, a study commissioned by the country's sector regulator determined. That is not good news for the world's largest cocoa producer. So apparently acreage has been put under cultivation that's not supposed to be. In Mauritania, ladies and gentlemen, members of parliament have filed a complaint against former President Aziz. Yep saying that he has besmirched them. Mauritanian parliamentarians filed a defamation suit against former President Wad Abdel Aziz. On the 15th of April, an interview with Jeune Afrique, the former president accused Parliament of having received a bribe of 300 million Ouigas from the government, the equivalent of nearly 700,000 euros or about 900,000 US dollars, to vote for the creation of a parliamentary commission of inquiry into his management of the country between 2008 and 2019. We parliamentarians, representatives of the Mauritanian people, are deeply outraged by the remarks made by the man who presided over the destiny of Mauritania for a decade, said Mohamed Lamine Amar, one of the parliamentarians who filed a complaint against the former Mauritanian president. These are hurtful statements, serious statements without any proof that harm our honor and our dignity. False allegations by which their author aims beyond the men to tarnish the image of the parliament. We are determined to clear our honor. Well, good luck with that, folks. Uh, we'll see what happens in Mauritania. Famously, the former president who stepped aside, he was the president when I served in Mauritania. He stepped aside and then was later charged with corruption, wound up being arrested and detained, and is facing serious corruption charges by the current government in quite a shocking development that took place in Mauritania just in the past couple of years. Meanwhile, in Tunisia, on the eve of the Eid al-Fitar, the annual event that takes place celebrating uh, an important holiday in the Islamic faith for Muslims around the world, Tunisia is imposing an intense lockdown over concerns about the pandemic and its spread in Tunisia during the Eid. Tunisia orders lockdown amid worst ever health crises. Under new rules, travel will be banned between regions, gatherings and celebrations prohibited, and a 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew will be imposed. Tunisia ordered a partial lockdown from Sunday for the week-long Eid al-Fitar holidays, warning that any further increase in coronavirus infections 
could overwhelm specialist care facilities. Announcing the measure on Friday, Prime Minister Hashim Michichi said Tunisia was going through the worst health crisis in its history. Mosque markets and non-essential businesses will be closed under the new restrictions, which come as Muslims mark the end of the month of Ramadan. 500 people currently in intensive care in Tunisia, in a country of approximately 11 million people. 500 people in intensive care. And that's a crisis that Tunisia apparently cannot manage. It says an awful lot about the state of medical care, which is unfortunate. I received medical care in Tunisia. It was quite adequate, um, very professional, very well-trained medical pro professionals when I was in Tunisia. And Namibia has an opportunity to expand its poultry sector. This coming from Poultry World. Namibia is dependent on imports, but looking to the future, says Rene Vanna, chairperson of the Namibia Poultry Producers Association, said opportunities exist for Namibia to grow its poultry sector and move closer to self-sufficiency. The country's six egg producers, which are all located near the cities of Vintok and Okhanja, close to markets, feed and other input suppliers market about 100 million eggs per year. So here's my question, ladies and gentlemen. Here's my question. Monthly demand for chicken is about 3,000 metric tons, of which only 1,700 are produced locally. So they have to import eggs. They have to import poultry. Why? Why can the baby not grow enough chicken? Enough chickens, I should say. Why can't they raise enough chickens and produce enough eggs? Well, as a former poultry producer, maybe my future is in Namibia and I'll start a poultry and turkey farm there. Chicken and turkey, and we'll see how it goes. Not hard. Not hard. This is not complicated. doesn't take a lot of land to raise poultry. It does not, although you have to buy a lot of feed if you don't have a lot of space. You keep chickens free range, it takes a little bit of space. And you can employ a lot of people because the collection of eggs, the, the care and feeding of the chickens, the dusting them off so they don't get mites and stuff like that. A lot of labor can be employed. So perhaps now's the time for Namibia to expand its poultry market. Why not? Meanwhile, the Speaker of the House Representative Nancy Pelosi has embarrassed herself yet again. And of course, she blames it on a staffer. The 19,000-year-old Speaker of the House of Representatives has embarrassed herself with a senior moment that is epic. And we all make mistakes, fair enough. But uh, someone who is responsible should have reviewed this. You don't want to have someone who wasn't even alive when Willie McCovey or Willie Mays played baseball to actually be reviewing the content you put out on your Instagram. <laughs> Or Twitter, excuse me. So Nancy Pelosi has shared the picture of the wrong Willie. There was Willie McCovey, who passed away in October of 2018. And then Willie Mays. Say hey, Willie. Uh, the famous San Francisco giant who is still alive at the age of 90. He's an octogenary now celebrating his birthday. And the ever, ever virtue signaling Nancy Pelosi decided to use this as a political opportunity to, you know, pad her laurels. But once again, screwed up royally. Nancy Pelosi shares photo of wrong black player and botched attempt to honor Willie Mays. <laughs> she tried to honor baseball legend Willie Mays for his 90th birthday on Thursday, but those plans were initially fouled up after the 81-year-old politician tweeted out a smiling photo of herself and Willie McCovey. Now, that picture has since disappeared. If you look there, you see two pictures. Nancy Pelosi, happy 90th birthday. That picture below is a picture of Nancy Pelosi with Willie McCovey, who's since passed away in 2018. The one on the right is with Willie Mays. And that's the one they posted after they retracted the original. But it was caught. A lot of observant people out there. Nancy Pelosi may not know, may be able to tell the difference between two legendary black baseball players, but the rest of us can. You'll notice that Willie McCovey had a very different appearance to his face and much darker complexion than Willie Mays. Yeah, and he's also, unfortunately, left this planet. Yeah, he died in 2018 at the age of 80. Yeah, so there you have it. So Nancy Pelosi's virtually signaling backfires, backfires on her. <clears throat> and in more news about ethnicity and race, since that's what the Biden administration lives on, well, let's and it's Congress, it's Democratic Congress, live on that. Let's talk about this. American farmers are suing the racist Biden administration for its failure to hold the Constitution. Specifically, they have concerns about the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment, which guarantees equal protection to all Americans. And that's not the case as the administration passes racist legislation which denies farmers relief funds based on the fact that they have the wrong skin color. Can you imagine this? Before the Civil Rights Act, we saw stuff like this happen all the time to black Americans, to Asian Americans. But with the Civil Rights Act enforcement, we had laws that were on the books, but they weren't enforced. But with the enforcement of the Civil Rights Act by the federal government around the country, those things were eliminated. But now it's official policy of the Manchurian cadaver to racially discriminate against Americans. 
Farmers sued Biden administration over racist COVID relief plan. Disabled white farmers sued President Biden's administration over his COVID loan forgiveness program, alleging he can't participate because he's white. Adam Faust, a white resident of Chilton, Calumet County in Wisconsin, is one of five Midwestern farmers who filed a lawsuit on April 6th that accused the federal government of violating their constitutional rights. The other plaintiffs are farmers from Wisconsin, Minnesota, South Dakota, and Ohio who have direct loans with the Farm Service Agency or USDA-backed loans that are otherwise eligible for the loan forgiveness program except for the color of their skin, according to the lawsuit. As per the lawsuit, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, or ARPA, provides $4 billion to forgive loans for socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. Now, that is racial discrimination, and let me make it very clear. The phrase socially disadvantaged includes explicit racial classifications, according to the lawsuit, which states that in order to be eligible for the debt relief, farmers and ranchers must be black, Native American, Hispanic, Asian American, or Pacific Islander. It contends that other farmers, white farmers, for example, are ineligible. Were plaintiffs eligible for the loan forgiveness benefit, they would have the opportunity to make additional investments in their property, expand their farms, purchase equipment and supplies, and otherwise support their families and local communities, the lawsuit says. The lawsuit requests the court enter a temporary and preliminary injunction preventing defendants from applying racial classifications when determining eligibility for loan modifications. Faust, who's the owner of Faust Farms, branded the program racist. It was just out and out racist. And I really don't think that there should be racism allowed in the federal government at any level, he told Fox 11. If somebody's green, I think they should be allowed to participate based on their actual qualifications of the program, not just picking an arbitrary thing like race. I don't see where they're going to be impacted any different than anybody else. I've never seen a government program based solely on that. I mean, it would have been against, if it would have been against the other race, everybody would have been on board and would have been complaining immediately. Well, ARPA is, in fact, part of the racist Biden administration's effort to divide the society on race as it continues to do each and every day. Folks, that's the news for today, May 8th. 2021, a Saturday. I hope you enjoyed the news and found it useful, informative analysis. Uh, we'll be with you again tomorrow for Indaba African News of the Day. Thanks for joining us. And if you're not a subscriber to Chris White Africa, hey, why not become one? This news is absolutely free. And unlike the propaganda you get on the cable networks, you're getting real news stories with genuine analysis from someone that actually knows what they're talking about. Not some talking head who just puts on a little makeup and went to college and was part of a sorority, fraternity or sorority. Anyway, folks, real-world experience, real-world knowledge, genuine analysis from an experienced professional who's lived and worked in all of these things. Thanks a lot. We'll catch you here next time on Adaba African News of the Day.